Hello, I am Dr. Rob Thornton, PhD. Thank you for your interest in my presentation given at the June 2022 Otorhinolaryngology Head and Neck Nurses Conference in Adelaide. As a former registered nurse now practicing as a gerontologist, I have studied and worked in the health field for five decades while employed as a clinician, educator, administrator, and an academic. I have worked in four states across Australia and in Japan during that time. On November 18, 2021, I underwent a total pharyngolaryngectomy and was discharged seven weeks later after a few complications that included a code blue. I had a voice prosthesis inserted in March 2022. My paper addresses my experiences, both good and bad, about going home with a Larry. I am a non-smoker and drink very little alcohol. As we have not been able to get an airtight seal around my stoma as yet, and therefore not being able to use my voice prosthesis, I remain non-verbal. You will have to endure my borrowed electronic voice during my presentation. My apologies for any voice alterations and fluctuations, as this is a low-budget retirement village production. I retired in 2011 as the inaugural Tasmanian State Manager of Organ Donation. This was a role that involved the establishment of this service and the employment of both clinical and administrative staff. I believe this level of organization has put me in a good place to manage, with support, this life-saving surgical intervention. As a person who loves public speaking it is a big departure for me to rely on technology to replace my voice, but I will do my best to add some non-verbals as we go along. Let's start. I had a total laryngectomy in November of last year. Total laryngectomy is the surgical procedure in which the larynx is totally removed and the airway is interrupted. Respiration occurs through a tracheal stoma resulting from bringing the trachea to the skin in the lower, anterior, cervical area. The patient, in this case, me, is left with a new means of breathing and speech and modification of the esophagus. My subglottic cancer was not attributed to any of the usual culprits and remains unexplained. I spent seven weeks in hospital where I was supported by wonderful medical and nursing staff with a dash of dietitians, physiotherapists, and speech pathologists. In March, I had a speech prosthesis inserted, and, for reasons outlined previously, I still cannot produce an adequate voice. I live with my wife Tina and dog Charlie in a well-appointed three-bedroom home in a retirement village in the Adelaide Hills. This offers us a secure and predictable physical and social environment, which is a great start to a home transition. Our neighbors are very supportive and within our cluster we have several former registered nurses and a retired anesthetist. Our children and families live here in Adelaide. I hope to give you some insight into what it is like to leave a well-supported healthcare facility with nursing and medical staff on hand and a call bell by using the following headings. Personal Support Reactions from others. The art of self-care. Diet modifications required. Resources, the musts and the nice-to-haves. Ready for emergencies. Financial implications. My Ten Commandments. I hope my presentation will also provide you with some insight into aspects of home management that could assist you with your care and support of other head and neck cancer patients that require this life-changing salvage surgery. I certainly do not have all the solutions, however, I have tried to make our home Larry friendly and less imposing on our daily lives. My absolute motto for the transition, if possible, is to keep calm and get organized as there are so many aspects to a successful transition. I left hospital with both good verbal and written advice on aspects of home management, however, in reality, 
many things came my way that I was not prepared for. I also observed during my seven-week hospital stay that if my nursing staff appeared to be well organized, I felt much more relaxed. Being negative only makes a journey more difficult. You may be given a cactus, in this case a laryngectomy, but you don't have to sit on it. Tina and I have known each other for 34 years, married for 27. She is a former RN, a most caring and skilled person with a good steady hand and excellent eyesight. In my humble opinion, this is an essential skill set as trying to maintain a functioning stoma often requires some assistance, especially if you have a very deep and irregular shaped stoma like me. I am very grateful to Tina for adding the electronic voice to this presentation. Charlie, who recently turned 10, is a blue healer in King Charles Cavalier Cross from the RSPCA. He is attracted to the sound of the nebulizer and always stays with us during stoma care. A loving dog with attitude and a great furry support. One of the supports offered to us was a home visit from a nurse, which happened the day after discharge. The RN was very enthusiastic, and she told us she had looked after many clients with a stoma. This degree of enthusiasm disappeared after I pointed to my neck, and Tina verbally informed her that the stoma was in my neck. The RN said, sorry, I have never seen your type of stoma before and have no idea what to do. My very best wishes for your recovery, and please take these forceps. Goodbye. This scenario was repeated when I was taken by ambulance as a code 1 patient to an A&E department. I was very well looked after, however I was thanked by the RN looking after me who said, it has been great looking after you as I have been in a and &E for nine years and never had to assist with your type of stoma. Thank you so much for the opportunity to look after you, I have learned so much. This scenario plays on my mind constantly when patients leave without community support. Whilst in hospital and doing my walks around the ward, I saw many patients who appeared overwhelmed by their surgery and the self-care required. This was especially so if they were returning to places far removed from the metropolitan area. Most people I know have been very understanding, especially within our retirement village and in shopping centers. The biggest, so-called negative, response has been from people I have known for years who just want version 1.0 of me back. Family and friends have had a range of reactions to seeing me post-discharge, often based on this commercial to quit smoking. Comments have either helped or hindered my recovery. An example would be sorry Rob. I just cannot do chronic conditions so best wishes. I hope you understand it is not you, it is just the thought of you so disfigured and not able to talk. I might send you a message every now and then, however please do not send photographs, they really upset me. One can easily imagine this scene within a village setting. In fact, shortly after coming home. The rumors had started that I was on my last legs. This prompted us to do a letterbox drop stating that I was still alive and not likely to die anytime soon. I have experienced many emotions since being at home. However, I try to always remain positive and focus on living well, but at times this is very difficult. These are some of the verbal comments I have had since being home. You are an inspiration. Surely you hate this situation? I would commit suicide if I was in your shoes. Well, now you are paying for your sins. Bet you wished you gave up drinking and smoking sooner. Are you still on baby food? 
Surely if you practiced, you could speak? Typical medical system, get you halfway then deserts you. Positive responses have come from family, close friends, and from some of the over 5,000 nursing students I have taught over the years. People who do not know me well and have no idea about the surgery, nor any idea about my drinking and or smoking habits, tend to react and speak without too much thinking. Because I cannot speak, I just endure the comments. Lucky for me, the good far outweigh the bad and ugly. I'm also glad we have Facebook so at least I can still type and chat. Since completing my PhD in gerontology some 20 years ago, my nickname has been Dr. Have a Chat. Now it is Dr. What Was That? I love talking to people and assisting whenever I can, especially older people. However, returning home, especially in a retirement village, has frustrated both me and some residents looking for assistance. Tina and I have also had to come to some agreement about how we would communicate, as not everyone is good at playing charades. We have enlisted the help of hand signals, a speech application on my mobile phone, and electronic writing pads. Some of my hand signals are, do you want coffee or tea? I'm going to have a shower. How much will it cost? And have you seen the dog? The mobile speech app that I use is free and has several useful phrases already built in. Lastly, the electronic writing pads I use can be bought online for about $8 each. They work just as well as those you can get for much more from well-known office suppliers. Positive words encourage cognitive brain function, while negative words activate our fight-or-flight response which slows cognitive function. They say, a single word has the power to influence the expression of genes that regulate physical and emotional stress. Self-care has been a challenge, however, as stated before, thinking of how to improve this aspect has led to some personal innovations. Despite improvements in hospital beds since I started my training in 1968, nothing beats your own bed. However, our dog tells us it is his bed, which he is prepared to share. Note the room humidifier was operational from day one. In this photo, I was 5 kilograms under my desired BMI, but today I am in the healthy range and have regained my weight loss. The first use of the phrase falling down the rabbit hole comes to us thanks to the great Lewis Carroll, who introduced the term in 1865 in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. In the story, Alice literally falls down the hole of the white rabbit, taking her to Wonderland. In this case, falling down the rabbit hole meant entering a strange and absurd alternate universe. This is a good description of Stoma Care. To get organized has been an intent of mine from the beginning, so we purchased a trolley and allocated shelves for all the equipment one might need in a nebulizer and Larry session. In addition, we use shelves in the linen press to store all the provided and purchased equipment. I find it easier to sit in a comfortable chair, rather than at a desk with a mirror, which was the recommendation in hospital. Nebulizing is an absolute must, it needs to be done three to five times a day. And if away from home, and hopefully one day on holiday, this little portable nebulizer should do the trick. Fear not, it does come with an appropriate attachment. As many of you know already, post-surgery, stomas can finish up in every shape and size. Therefore, to see what needs to be done I have found an extra good light source is required. A torch did not do it for me, nor did a makeup mirror and desk as previously mentioned. So, time to get inventive. I decided I would make my own light source. 
The three ingredients for the handheld light source are a bargain shop mirror, a headlamp with at least 300 lumens of lighting, and some blue tack. Step 1 is to take the strap off the headlamp. Step 2 is to stick the headlamp with batteries to the mirror using blue tack. And step 3, turn on. I posted my final product on an international laryngectomy Facebook site and received some 180 comments. This little invention is without patents so feel free to make and use. Manual dexterity is the ability to make coordinated hand and finger movements to grasp and manipulate objects. Manual dexterity includes muscular, skeletal, and neurological functions to produce small, precise movements. Development of these skills occurs over time, primarily during childhood. They may need a huge refresher course if you need to look after your laryngectomy and render stoma and voice prosthesis care. Neck swelling was initially a major problem limiting my ability to turn my head from side to side. My strategy was to seek the assistance of a physiotherapist. He has been giving me short laser therapy treatments with good effect. I have these sessions weekly. Ice collars have also been beneficial. Lastly, following a bouncing ball on my computer screen is much more enjoyable for me than a set of prescribed exercises. Neck flexibility has improved, however now when I drive, I tend to avoid intersections which require you to look in multiple directions before safely crossing traffic. Prior to surgery, eating was enjoyable and eating out was something to look forward to. Since surgery, maintaining my weight and eating has been a big challenge to say the least. I am now, despite dilatations, still limited to pureed food. What can I say? It is what it is, and it keeps me alive and well. The process of making pureed food is very time-consuming so Meals on Wheels came to the rescue, providing me with three main meals a week. Fluids are okay, so going out for a meal only means going out for a coffee and maybe a soft lemon cheesecake. But only if I consume it slowly with sips of water between bites. I have not found a restaurant that does pureed food. In addition to poached eggs and avocado, I have found that sourdough bread, if eaten slowly and minus the crusts, is a winner especially when homemade. High protein drinks are an excellent way for me to maintain weight if it starts to decline. Or if I have a difficult swallowing day, or my voice prosthesis is leaking. At 2000 calories a bottle it is the equivalent to 4 Big Macs. In addition to the supplies provided by South Australia Health, thank you very much. I have found other resources need to be obtained to make the successful transition. Day 2 at home, the South Australia government supplies arrived. It was a little overwhelming, however everything now has a place. In 6 months, we have gone through 3 food processors, so this required us to buy a much more powerful variety with additional cutting blades. My boomerang pillow is a must. Some nights, if regurgitation is a problem or if my airway is playing up, sitting up in bed is the best way I have found to maximize a sound sleep. In addition, a small humidifier produces an environment that reduces my airway and stoma drying out too much, especially now in the colder months when air tends to be dry. The internet is almost awash with people and groups offering information and assistance. However, one must be mindful of the validity and credibility of many sites. I have found the book shown here to be very good. Although a United States publication, it has been a good source of information.
A closer image will appear on the next slide. Written by a pediatrician who has had a laryngectomy, it covers almost every aspect of Larry Care. A hard copy can be bought for around $20, or a downloadable version is free. Lastly, it has been printed in 18 languages. This could be a valuable resource for non-English speaking patients. Having speech pathologists on call seven days a week during business hours is a true blessing. Of course, my voice prosthesis has always become blocked out of business hours. However, with the Larry cleaning brush held in position, one can still drink fluids and take oral medications until help is available. Despite all the self-care, things can still go wrong. In my story, it has been bleeds from my stoma in the early days needing urgent hospital attention. A quick trip to the local hospital found it was well beyond the treatment they could provide as even the word laryngectomy looked like a mystery. Luckily, the blood leaking from the stoma saw an almost immediate transfer to the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I have had two emergency situations since surgery. One code blue in hospital and the other at home, which required a code one ambulance trip. Both were substantial bleeds from my stoma due to issues arising from pre-surgical anticoagulant treatment and the weaning process from same. Both bleeds were stopped with silver nitrate sticks. From my lived experience, when changing from one of these medications and back again, it needs to be very carefully thought out. Just one big cough can disrupt a small blood vessel in the initial stages. Here is another great package of products alerting others that one does not breathe in the normal manner. I have a wristband and a label on the front windscreen of our car. This is the little emergency kit that goes with us every time we leave the house for an outing. One never knows what will happen as one big cough can block your Larry tube. Or one of yesterday's soft lemon slices can block a voice prosthesis. This is the last thing you would need in an emergency. This situation, however, has been reported multiple times on various websites. I must admit I had no idea when leaving hospital how much money we would have to find to buy supplies over and above the products provided by the South Australia government. Admittedly, I chose to use an HME rather than a fabric Buchanan bib. Must-haves Tilly's forceps, $80 Voice prosthesis brushes, $100 for a year's supply Heat moisture exchange, HME, buttons, $2,000 a year Other states supply these free, but not in South Australia Second Larry tube, $180 a robust food processor, $200. Cotton buds and tissues, $100 a year. Portable nebulizer, $200. A total of $2,860. Nice to haves. Storage trolley, $60. Bedside humidifier, $60. High-protein milk drinks subsidized at $850 a year. Lightly sparkling mineral water, $400 a year, minus 10 cents for each recycled bottle. Meals on wheels, $1,560 a year. Pulse oximeter, $48. Mini nebulizer, $35. A total of $3,013. All up, nearly $6,000.
Firstly, if you remember this scene, it would have been around 1956 and when you went to see the movie The Ten Commandments. Given this is one of the first movies I saw growing up in Sydney, I thought I would close with my own Ten Commandments for successful home management of a laryngectomy. Thou shalt be diligent with your stoma care. It is your passage to living. Thou shalt always be the last to finish your meal as your newly reconstructed food pipe is no longer an expressway. You should not attempt to bend or pick up something for one hour past a main meal for fear of regurgitation. Remember your bronchial cilia love a humid environment, so therefore look after them by regular nebulization. Be as less reliant on loved ones as you possibly can be. They also have a life to live. When eating or drinking hot food or fluids you will remove your HME. For you know your respiratory system will react with a rush of rubbish. Thou shalt try to find new ways every day to improve the quality of your life, be inventive. Thou shalt keep your healthcare team aware of issues and concerns, as they do not read minds and are happy to help. Move and exercise every day. You need to remember that stasis is the basis of infection. The Final Tenth Commandment If you are having a difficult day, you will remind yourself about the citizens of Ukraine. I hope this presentation was useful to your professional practice and thank you for putting up with my electronic voice. I love public speaking, however today it just was not going to happen. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story. I can truly say it has left me speechless. Please take care.